it gets stuck sometimes and we think, well, what do we need to do next? And it's not necessarily what we need to do. It's what do we need to pause, right? What do we need to pause? And there are certain lifestyle things we need to pause. Like we need to pause negative thinking. Like there's no place for that. We need to pause. We need to pause and take time for ourselves, self-care. Resentment is lack of self-care. We need to remember that, especially as women, and we're feeling the stressors of our lives. And there are certain foods and food patterns of eating that we need to pause. So always pausing with intermittent fasting and no more snacking, ideally. And sometimes it's pausing certain inflammatory foods. Sometimes it's pausing meat. Sometimes it's pausing greens, you know, pausing and doing a cleanse altogether. This is Impact, the podcast where we explore entrepreneurship, mindset, and health to provide you with the ingredients for an unregrettable version of your life story. Early in my career, especially, I had this tendency to attract menopausal women. I won't say perimenopausal women because, yes, that is a huge spectrum of time in a woman's life, but specifically women who are like, oh gosh, it is happening. Now, menopause by definition is a year without your period. Perimenopause is sort of the 10 years on either side of that. But there's this fear that we have as women. I would argue it's almost universal that this transition to menopause is is this movement away from this fertile, floating, effervescent, energy-filled. It's not because I have three kids and I can tell you it's not those things. But it is this really big, it's this big transition. We make it a big transition in our mind. And I was having such a flood of women, menopausal or postmenopausal women come into my practice that I was really determined to, to find a new way of looking at this phase of life. Now, this was happening when I was like 29, 30 years old. And, and I have to say, even then, I felt inauthentic in my enthusiasm for wanting to understand this phase of life until I actually really leaned into it. Now, if you're wondering, why, why am I even talking about this? We have a series of podcasts where the through line is all about thinking outside the box and having a different frame of reference. I can tell you that the frame of reference for the majority of women around the world is that menopause is this thing we don't necessarily want to have. And if our menopause is like our mother's menopause, it's going to be hot and bothered for a long period of time and not hot and bothered in the way we were hoping for in our early 30s. But the deeper I leaned into this notion and the more I started to, uh, to learn about this phase of life, I became fascinated with the physiological changes that actually empower women through this phase. This idea, and I knew this as a naturopathic doctor, but this idea that menopause is fraught with hot flashes and vaginal dryness and incessant moodiness are common symptoms, but they are not normal symptoms. And as I leaned into what is normal, what happens in the body in a normal state, in a nourished, in a healthy state, what's so fascinating to me is the changes that happen in a woman's brain. Literally, the amygdala in the brain, the center in the brain responsible for the integration of memories. And by integration, I mean the derivement of meaning towards those memories. That part of your brain literally starts to expand. Your capacity to draw on past experience and leverage it for wisdom in the present time to see the wisdom in your past experience is literally facilitated by an anatomical and physiological change in your body. That is what is normal. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. So as I was pulling together the series, as we were starting to look at concepts that are actually outside the box of traditional thinking, and I, I, I was pulling together where I wanted to go on the side of health. I was really specific in the conversation that I wanted to have. And in fact, the person that I wanted to have this conversation with. And I'm so excited because you're about to have an opportunity to hear from one of my friends and an amazing thinker and leader in the women's health space. And her name is Dr. Anna Kabeca. And she is the creator of some really cool programs, the Keto Green Diet, which is the keto green way. How, how do we approach a ketogenic diet or an intermittent fasting in our life as perimenopausal or menopausal women, but do it in such a way that we are not creating more inflammation in our body. We are not increasing our risk for osteoporosis. She is not only a triple board certified 
Ob's Gyne, but she also is an incredible entrepreneur. And in our conversation today, you have the opportunity to get to know a woman who is embracing her own wisdom in life. You're going to have the opportunity to hear from a woman who has been prolific in her writing and in her influence on women's health. And what we are going to get into in our conversation today is the wisdom of the meno pause. And what's so compelling about this idea is that I guarantee it will change your perspective on that perimenopausal era of your life, that menopausal transition that we move through as women, and the opportunity to see our lives in an entirely new light on the other side of the line of menopause. And so it is without further ado that I introduce you to my friend, Dr. Anna Kabeca. Dr. Anna Kabeca, welcome to Impact. Megan, it is great to be here with you. <laughs> oh, I am delighted to have this conversation. I had to finally interrupt us and say, we're just going to hit record because there was just so much goodness that was emerging from our conversation behind the scenes. And oh, we were having good girlfriend talk. That we were having good girlfriend talk with the girlfriend conversation, doctor. laughter. I mean, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> and I just want to clarify for everyone, we actually are not doing this interview with wine in hand. We were sort of lamenting the influence of wine on our midlife female bodies. And we'll we'll get into some of these pieces <laughs> as we as we move deeper into this conversation. But here's where I want to start. I want for you to share with my audience and with my listeners, what you shared with me beforehand. And I asked you about, you know, is there an experience or story where you really felt the influence of your own impact and of your own power? And you shared this incredibly inspiring story with me. And I'd love to start there. I'd love for that to set the stage of our conversation. Thank you. You know, it's just uh, almost two years ago when the pandemic hit, right? And we didn't know what was happening. We would be closing our businesses and our kids went to homeschooling, virtual schooling. And I had all my girls in house and, and trying to teach them and thinking, how do we create normalcy? And certainly being a believer that relationships, connection, community is, you know, one of the best medicines we can do. Oh my gosh, all of this is dissolving. How do I keep normalcy for my youngest who was 12 at the time? And I'm a single mom, financially responsible for all of them and trying to juggle all of this. And so in the middle of this, the rodeo continues. And one of Ava's rodeo trainers, because she's a horseback rider, she does something called barrel racing. And they run around these barrels really, really fast in a cloverleaf pattern. So you like zoom up, spin around those barrels, and it's you and the horse. And she loved doing it. So the trainer in East Dallas, Martha Josie, she's 80 years old, and she still rides horses every day. And she's an amazing trainer. So she was like, I'm still having it. You guys will wear masks and we're outside every day and y'all just come on. And so I rented a RV, you know, rent an RV, they bring it on site. And I stayed with her because I wanted to make sure that, you know, everything was good for this camp. And we actually were there three weeks, three weeks of horseback riding camp in East Texas, in the middle of the summer. And it was amazing. And Ava met this trainer and she said, well, come let Ava train with me outside of Dallas for two months. And I guarantee you, she'll be at the top of her game. She has so much potential. So as a mom, you're like, oh, of course, my child has so much potential. And I'm thinking, you know, Dallas, hell no. I took my oral boards for OBGYN in Dallas and it was a very scary situation. But I came and we stayed for two months, rented an Airbnb. And before you knew it, I was like, okay, let's, let's keep this up. Let's stay. And I just closed on my house yesterday. I've moved to Dallas in the middle of a pandemic. My daughter's thriving. She's at the top of her game and her ambition. And the world is good. My business continues to do amazing. I'm really blessed. And I love the impact I'm making on women's lives and being able to share this story as a single mom, making these transitions and just following my heart. I will say God and family first, right? Keeping my priorities straight and doing what I'm passionate about. So it's, it's 
all of this transition, here I am two years later, now, you know, a Texas landowner, I drive a Ford F-350 and haul a 33 foot horse trailer. We've got a couple horses about to buy another one. (laughs) I never honestly ever thought I would be doing any of this. So, and it's fun. It's the best time of my life. Uh, Can we just like, we need to just hit pause. It's we shouldn't hit pause because this is an audio experience. <laughs> but uh, I really honor and lean into this idea that you just said this is the best. This is the best time of my life. And and one of the things we were discussing before, and, and you and I have great opportunities to connect throughout the course of the year, which I relish so much. Can we just share with everybody a little bit more about your background and what you bring to the table? You you speak to this notion of the keto green way and. You have a background in clinical obstetrics and gynecology, and you are really and have been on a path of commitment towards changing the language of women's health for the better part of the last decade. Share with us a little bit about that journey, because that's quite the transition from that traditional physician role to the version of impact that we're witnessing you deliver today. You know how they say your mess becomes your message? (laughs) That's certainly true. And, you know, here I am at 55. I'll be 56 this year. My daughter turns 14 this month. I'm a single mom and have been for over a decade. And there's been highs and lows in my life and closed my practice. I didn't know how I was going to pay the rent on my house. I actually had to move out and rent my house. And so, like, there's been such an incredible transition in my life. And I think about, thank God, what I know in functional medicine. I wish no physician the journey I've been on to learn what I know because there's been so much trauma and hardship in it. But I can stand from a place of being rebuilt, being rebuilt and strong. And I'm here for anyone, right? I really want to help others not suffer and take control. So part of my journey is, you know, being trained in in the best institution, I always say the best institution in the world, Emory University for OBGYN. I mean, it's amazing. I came into my own life, my own story, and my doctor's bag was empty. So at 39, I had infertility and early menopause, and I was told the, you know, I failed the highest doses of injectable meds. At 39, when I'd been helping hundreds, of, you know, of women get pregnant, couples get pregnant. And there I was, you know, had had three children at that time, but and here I was told I could not never have another baby. The only option for me was egg donation. That's it. High levels for our physicians, high levels of FSH, no cycle, only hormonally induced cycles, failed the highest doses of injectable fertility meds with no ovarian response. Look, it did these ultrasounds. I saw these ultrasounds. And so that was just like, that was, it blew my mind. But Megan, that took me, you know, I had, I had a sabbatical, took me on a sabbatical and that took me around the world. But I will say I went around the world to learn that everywhere you go, there you are. <laughs> But as a result of this, learning healing foods, filling my doctor's bag up with some traditional medicine, and the grace of God reversed that early menopause, became pregnant spontaneously and delivered a healthy baby girl at age 41. And, you know, that was that just added to my to my practice and to my journey, and then help rebuild my soul and my spirit. But yet there was that PTSD that was under the surface from our trauma, family trauma. And our family trauma of losing my child, losing our son, our toddler son in a dramatic accident. So you can imagine the stress of that. And as physicians, we weren't told that this stress can cause infertility, can cause early menopause. I mean, that's not, that, it wasn't part of my specialist, my reproductive endocrinologist specialist angle. He's like, nope, egg donation. And that's, that's the best we knew. And so that led me to like, God, I see so many things more clearly at Emory University in surgery. We have a saying that the eyes don't see what the mind don't know. The eyes don't see what the mind don't know. And that is so true is true for me. I see a lot clearly now. (laughs) But one of the things is that at 48, I started spiraling down again. At that point, single mom, physiology of divorce is what I write about, the cortisol oxytocin disconnect. So the physiology of divorce, the physiology of burnout, I experienced all of that. And honestly, then I started like having the brain fog, 48, all the menopausal symptoms, blaring up, brain fog, anxiety, mood swings, irritability, menstrual irregularities, hair loss. But the weight gain, having been at one point well over 240 pounds, 
in my life and then losing that and keeping it off to have 20 pounds come back overnight without doing anything different. I mean, Megan, how many times do we hear from our patients, I'm gaining weight without doing anything different, right? And I was like, ah, sure, there's not a snicker bar in that bag of yours, you know, like what's going on? Your thyroid's normal, you know, you're fine. Just exercise, you know. You're fine. I'm like, wait, shit, I'm really not doing anything different. What's going on? Hormones are in check. And that's why my first book, The Hormone Fix, I say it takes more than hormones to fix your hormones, right? And there's so many pieces of that. So that took me on this journey into my creating my keto green way, going into a ketogenic, low carbohydrate diet, feeling crazy and hitting a wall. And then realizing that I, my body was struggling, I say acidified, right? Inflamed because of the ketogenic diet and add on healthy amounts of stress. So that led me to alkalinizing dietary choices, the low carbohydrate greens, herbs, spices, bone broth, and alkalinizing behaviors. That's not something I learned about either. Ooh, let's talk about that. It's so beautiful because like the whole physiology of our, our minds, our thoughts, our activities and how it can affect our physical body. So this is what I found during that process is that when I went keto, I checked my urine pH and I was like, especially when I was hitting the wall, I'm like, what's going on? Check urine pH. And it was as acidic as the urine pH paper would read, right? Like as acidic. So the lowest is like a 5.0 and it was, you know, could have been lower. And that was an aha moment for me because in functional medicine, we say, okay, we want an alkalinizing modified elimination diet as part of your initial detox plan, check urine pH. Urine pH research has shown that a high alkaline urine pH gives you a lower risk for inflammatory diseases such as cancer and metabolic syndrome. Now we know a higher urine pH is associated with clearing your body from uric acid. So from Dr. Perlmutter's book, Drop Acid, and, you know, the whole, that. I know it's so good. And, um, and I, I thought that was just fascinating because a ketogenic diet is very acidifying. But what I found during this experiment on myself was that as I added those alkalinizing foods, the beet greens, bone broth, etc. But as I woke up in the morning and I would go out and walk on the beach or go for a walk or a gratitude journal, my urine pH was more alkaline all day compared to the mornings I didn't. Come on! And I was like, what the heck is going on? So, of course, I dig into renal physiology. And cortisol increases hydrogen ion secretion across the renal tubules. So, if you are stressed, you're going to have a more acidic urine pH. That was an aha moment. And so, the converse, because cortisol and oxytocin are like opposite ends of a coin, right? Flip sides. And so, oxytocin is the most alkalinizing hormone, where cortisol is the most acidifying. So make love, laugh, pray, have a positive attitude, right? These are oxytocin increasing behaviors. Your urine pH will be more alkaline. I'm going to totally experiment with this. Totally I know that I don't believe you, it. but I'm, no, ob please. I'm obsessed with like how we, okay. Yes, not just in our diet, right? We get so focused on what we eat, but there's so much more to it. There's so much more to it. And that's the whole way, the keto green way, I call it, or lifestyle. There's the healthy keto and green foods that we combine with intermittent fasting, no snacking. And the principles, the pause, I say it's in the pauses of our life where the magic happens. It's really recreating a physiology of health. And it goes right in line with blue zones. What are things that they do? You know, and, and I always joke, I say, you know, is it the glass of wine that increases yes. longevity? Oh, when you, oh yes, <laughs> oh, you I know, done. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm sending you a bottle of my favorite in a minute. <laughs> Or is it the people you're having wine with at the table laughing and celebrating and enjoying each other? The oxytocin increasing behavior right. trumps anything else. Absolutely. When it's so interesting as you're talking about this in terms of like renal physiology and even from a Chinese medicine perspective, when we start to look at the influence of the kidney and in Chinese medicine, all of these organs, you know this, I'm talking to everybody. All these organs are associated with emotions and the emotion that renders the kidney most vulnerable is fear. And it just makes me pause. We're going to get into the pauses in life in a second, but it just makes me pause for a moment because I really do feel that we are sitting in a bathtub 
full of fear right now. There is an epidemic of fear dialogue. And I keep joking that I go onto Twitter to palpate how deep the fear is. And it's, it's really, it's really deep right now. And I know you and I've had some conversations about this. If you were going to give people three things they could do right now to help mitigate the influence of that fear, what would you do? And then we'll all test our urine to see what happens. But what would those three things be? Uh, Urology professor in med school said this to me because Anna you're the only one who can upset yourself right and I was like oh no my husband and boyfriend can piss me off right whatever the situation is he said no you choose how to react so it's true I am the only one who can upset myself I can choose how to respond and that's an important check now physiology drives our behavior so we have to shift our physiology to affect our behavior and vice versa The second thing I would do, and it's a practice that I do every morning before I even open my eyes, and I look at, you know, what am I grateful for? You know, really want to start the day with a positive charge, right? A positive charge versus a negative charge. Doesn't that sound better? I want to have a positive charge, high vibration. So before I get out of bed, before I do anything, I think, what am I grateful for? I'm so blessed. Yesterday, Ava gave me flowers and a cute little note that said, you can do anything you want to do, quote. Dr. Anna Quebec, I was so cute. And then in parentheses, mom. And what a blessing that was to receive that, right? What am I grateful for? And that's also like, where did I see love? I totally saw love in that moment. And focusing on love and gratitude, that that is the highest vibration. Love, gratitude, compassion. And I think that's where that's where it starts. So that is again that alkalinizing principle, that oxytocin increasing principle. And the other thing is laughter. Laughter. Oh my God, have fun. When did you laugh last? When did you do a full belly laugh? Like, when did you talk to your friend who always makes you laugh? And how can you be that? Where can you find laughter in what you did or didn't do? You know, and so, so those are the three things that are game, they really are. It's game changing, honestly. And this comes from someone who, not even a, you know, maybe let's see, a decade ago, I wanted to die every day. I wanted, I didn't know how I could live. I was so depressed had such blaring PTSD. I mean, so it is principles and practices that shift our physiology to bring us to a state of like living your most passionate life. Amazing. And so on this notion of, of living your most passionate life, and you alluded to this before, um, you said, you know, it's in, the, it's in the pauses of life. And I want to unpack a really big life pause, this pause known as menopause. <laughs> And we were discussing this before. I've had a fascination clinically with menopause my whole career. And I remember as this like bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, 20-something-year-old practitioner and women would come in and complain about menopause. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's like the greatest time. And I'm pretty sure they wanted to punch me <laughs> in the face. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But I'm, I really am deeply fascinated with the sh- like how our brain shift and how our physiology shifts to actually like attune us into these these entities with like tremendous capacity for wisdom and impact and actualization. I remember Christine Northrop talking about this. She's like, literally our bodies and brains change in such a way that we emerge from this phase of life where we are nurturing to everyone else. And we are like physiologically predestined to nurture ourselves and our dreams. And I was like, get me some of that. It sounds incredible. And impactful, right? Impactful. That's where you create impact. Mm-hmm. Yes. And so here's what I want you to help us to do is really understand how we can harness our physiology to have that impact. You have a new book coming out next week, which I'm so excited about, but it really is about the ingredients of how we can take control of these pieces as women. Where do we start to be able to harness our physiological power to have impact? It is shifting that physiology, shifting our physiology to what we're really designed to do and to empower our hormones at this stage of life. So yeah, my book coming out is Menu Pause. (laughs) So I love the word. And it's It's so um, good. It's so good. And we were joking. I always say that, you know, the next book will be about the men you pause. <laughs> well, that's Part a whole two. nother story. Yeah. <laughs> Single mom <laughs> dating in my 50s, a whole nother story. But yeah. <laughs> so men you pause. And it is where working with women, you know, working with tens of thousands of women, identifying like foundationally, it's the keto green, like my way is the keto green way. 
And then where do we get stuck in that? Again, when do we get stuck? Because we've been doing this now for seven, seven years. I've had clients who've been following the Keto Green plan for over seven years now. And we get stuck sometimes and we think, well, what do we need to do next? And it's not necessarily what we need to do. It's what do we need to pause, right? What do we need to pause? And there are certain lifestyle things we need to pause. Like we need to pause negative thinking. Like there's no place for that. We need to pause. We need to pause and take time for ourselves, self-care. Resentment is lack of self-care. We need to remember that, especially as women, and we're feeling the stressors of our lives. And there are certain foods and food patterns of eating that we need to pause. So always pausing with intermittent fasting and no more snacking, ideally. And sometimes it's pausing certain inflammatory foods. Sometimes it's pausing meat. Sometimes it's pausing greens, you know, pausing and doing a cleanse altogether. So that's where menu pause came from, or five different eating plans, which we pause something different, only six days, because we know as functional medicine providers too, like the gut lining re-epithelialize essentially, uh, regenerates in 72 hours. So six days is two 72-hour cycles on these different pauses, and then we have that check-in with ourselves well, how do I feel after this? So it kind of, it really does make sense to be able to do this and get a great result. Amazing. What kind of results are people getting? Well, we did in my girlfriend doctor club, I took them right into probably the most restrictive pause. And that is my cleanse. So it is my menu pause cleanse. And so you're on smoothies and drinking bone broth and doing a liver gallbladder flush, you know, or olive oil, lemon juice, kind of a special recipe in my book for that. And it is that six days, right? And I will say the seventh day is the day of rest. You can fast, you can feast, you can experiment, you can whatever, right? But, so I like playing with that because that's a train, that's a learning day. So my clients, I had one woman, she lost 10 pounds, 11 pounds in six days. And that was right before Thanksgiving, only gained a pound down during Thanksgiving, pound back. And so it was really, it was amazing. And then lost in inches around the waist, feeling clearer, skin glowing, healthy. And that's definitely what we've seen. And the Keto Green Extreme Pause, that's another one. It's an auto, it's following autoimmune protocol. So eliminating nightshades, sometimes because I love, you know, I'm Middle Eastern background. So I do all these international stuff too in food, like eggplant, baba ganoush, and, and tomatoes. And, you know, those are, and mushrooms. Oh my gosh, some of my favorite foods, but they can be very inflammatory to other people. So how does it look when we pause that? Sometimes just that pause giving your cells, your intestinal lining, a chance to regenerating, working with the ingredients to help balance your hormones. It's enough of a reboot, a kickstart. I really love this idea of one, just calling it a pause and not a detox and not like, I just feel like there's so much baggage with some of these, I was going to call them interventions, but they're not even interventions. They're opportunities. I Um, like that. But this Mm -hmm. notion, this notion of a pause, I, I really, I really love that. Can you specifically address the role of alcohol on a perimenopausal body? I do not want to believe it or admit to it. So I'm going to so just plead plug the your fit. ears, ladies, oh, if right, that's what I you know. need to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This is not coming out of my mouth. But honestly, this is something that I've certainly, I mean, I've, I've been a wine lover since, you know, forever, right? I made wine for seventh grade science fair project. I mean, that was on my table growing up. You were a keener. I was. <laughs> and so, I mean, it was, just, it's, you know, it's, I grew up with it as a condiment, right? Not a drink, right? This is that. So that's how I grew up. But it was very interesting. It's very interesting. There is no question that alcohol has detrimental effect on our bodies. In the perimenopause, menopause time period, you know, it can impact us in ways that decrease, derail us from reaching our goal, the direction where we want to go or or achievement that we want. And it's so true. And I would say once in a while, like everything, once in a while, that's fine. But like the concept of daily glass of wine, a daily, I mean, it really, you know, that's not, it's not based on science. It really is not. You have to look very clearly at what, what is it bringing to you in your life? And I believe in like the lower alcohol, like I love, you know, I love tequila, right? Like there's medicinal benefit to alcohol. I mean, I've got all the excuses, right? I mean, I think that in menopause and, and postmenopause, it really is that one thing we have to limit more than, you know, most anything else, like smoking and alcohol. You think we actually have to, we have to limit it more than anything else? I think we have to limit it 
more than anything else. And I hate to even say that, like, you know, like we have to limit sugar more than anything else. We have to limit alcohol more than anything else. It's at the top of the list. It's at the top of the list. And I don't want to say it, but it's true. I'm going to ask you one more time, Anna, do you really, no, I'm just kidding. I know, I know. Can we have a (laughs) glass of wine and discuss this? (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes I talk about this idea of, of a glass of wine and my husband looks at me, he's like, do you really, he doesn't, he doesn't drink very much. He's like, do you really need the glass of wine? I'm like, I don't need the glass of wine. I need the glass that can hold wine because to, to me, it's exactly what we talked about before. It's, it's about getting together with the girlfriends. It's about the symbolism, literally holding that symbolism that reminds me of like gathering and, and conversation and some of those finer pieces in life. Celebration, right? Celebration, right? What the glass actually holds is of less importance than having this symbol. And so there's days I have these great fermented vinegars, like drinking vinegars, and I will, yeah, your face. I wish everyone could see these faces. I know, like, huh? Oh, there you would love them. They will okay, just totally will try shift them. the alkalinity of that of that urine. So they're these drinking vinegars, and then you can dilute them, and they. They just have this real complexity, this fermented, your face is still not supporting my enthusiasm, but <laughs> that's okay. They have here, this real complexity. Here, let flavor. me take your glass of wine away and give you this <laughs> fermented vinegar. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm all, I'm all game. I'm ready for try it. <laughs> right. It's, it, but it's really, it's about that. Uh, it's about that uh, ritual and some of those exciting pieces in life. And you've referenced a few times this notion of like the keto green way. And I want everyone to know. Dr. Anna and I did a podcast way, way back in the day when I had that podcast called the Anthropology Podcast, where we uh, discussed the keto green way and ketosis and intermittent fasting for women. So we'll reference that in the show notes. But for the purposes of this conversation, when you speak to this notion of the keto green way, what are you talking about, Dr. Anna? Before I go there, Megan, can I just say like with these pauses, like you said, what you fill the glass with? I mean, I totally agree. Like I'll fill the glass with my smoothie. I'll fill the glass with sparkling water. I'm drinking, I'm substituting, really cutting back on my coffee, but I'm putting sparkling water in my coffee cup. You know, I mean, that's it. There's just sparkling water in there. And yeah, no wine, no tequila. That's really sparkling water. And so, but also with the whole alcohol journey, because I know it's an area of resistance, but sometimes it's a crutch and it's a crutch because we need, you know, we need support. And it's not giving you support. That's why you always need that crutch. And so like, you know, taking a pause in alcohol in midlife in in menopause and postmenopause physiologically is really important for women because it's often an obstacle that's keeping us from where we want to go. And it doesn't mean forever, right? It means continue your, your celebrations, but it's not an every night thing. You know, maybe it's a seventh day thing. Maybe it's a once a month thing. Maybe you're setting a goal and an aspiration, but you really need to be honest with yourself to say, is it serving me or is it not serving me? Is right. it serving me? Is it not, will it hurt me if I don't do it for a while? Right. So the keto green way, the keto green way, that is where we're doing intermittent fasting, 13 to 16 hours on average for women between dinner and breakfast. We know that reduces risk of cancers and studies looking at women with breast cancer. Intermittent fasting of over 12 and a half hours had a significantly reduced risk of recurrent breast cancer. You know, amen to that. That's so powerful. So it's intermittent fasting, healthy fats, high quality, clean protein sources. And we need good amounts of protein in menopause and beyond and low carbohydrate, dark green leafy vegetables, sprouts, herbs, and spices to help with the alkalinizing effects on our, on our physiology, support our minerals, but even more importantly, it's supporting our microbiome and the gut microbial diversity. And we know gut microbial diversity is associated with strong immune system and decreased inflammatory and metabolic diseases. So that's key. And then looking at the work by Dr. Johnson on uric acid and and published by Dr. Perlmutter on uric acid, you need things that are going to clear your body of uric acid and definitely ketogenic diets long term especially if you're metabolically prone to that, like those of us with warrior physiology, whether it's Native American, Viking, Middle Eastern, you know, whatever we're designed, we've survived because our body will grab onto what it's need, become very metabolically efficient, right? You know, in other words, become storage vehicles, like I can live in the Sahara for six months and I without food and I will be fine, right? That's my physiology. 
So we have to look at these things. So adding in those alkalinizers, but no snacking, and then the lifestyle behavior. So how are we, you know, how are we talking to ourselves during the day? How are we nurturing ourselves during the day? What toxins are in our foods and our environment that could be affecting us? What food sensitivities could be affecting us? So looking and testing, not guessing, checking your own pH and ketones is really important when you are bumping into ketosis. You don't have to stay there. You know, metabolic flexibility is really important, but you got to bump into that combination periodically and see how, you know, see how you feel. What do we do with our coffee? Okay, this is so fascinating to me. So in my second book, Keto Green 16, I was trying out all kinds of recipes. I'd been working on that for a year and I wore continuous glucose monitor for the whole year. And so pretty much for the pretty much on and off for the whole year, whenever I was testing recipes. And this is what I found out. Like bizarre enough, when I get up and have my espresso, because I have an espresso maker and I've had one for 20 something years now. So I love espresso. But when I would get up and have my espresso, I would be more acidic and my blood sugar would go up like 20 points because caffeine on my delicate adrenals drove up my cortisol, which drove up my glucose. And it took me a little while to make that connection, but it absolutely is a true connection. And so that was one thing. So caffeine was bumping up my blood sugar, breaking my fast. I could wake up, and this is why testing is so important. I could wake up in ketosis and alkaline, have a cup of coffee and be acidic. Okay, I got that, but I was out of ketosis. What was doing that? It wasn't until I was wearing the continuous glucose monitor, I was like, oh, my blood sugar is going up, you know, that makes sense. And then the same thing with high intensity workouts, that was something that blood sugar would go up on and drop me out of ketosis, even in fasting, right, exercising fasting. So those were fascinating findings. So to say that about coffee, again, you know, coffee, wine and chocolate, three of my vices that I did have done research on supporting their benefits, there are certainly benefits. But look, one of the things that I learned in my journeys around the world, I even stayed on a coffee plantation in Brazil, Cafe Elena, you know, coffee plantation in Brazil. But when did they drink coffee? Not first thing when you wake up at the end of your meal. And it was an espresso. So it wasn't that first thing in the morning thing we do in America. At the end of your meal, your insulin's up, you know, your insulin's already going up. So it'll support that coffee physiology. So I think that's where some of us make mistake in drinking that coffee first thing in the morning. So I, you know, compromise, I usually love it uh, later to break my fast, but I also will drink an alkalinizing drink, I'll drink my Mighty Maca Plus first, that alkalinizing beverage too, and that seems to temper the blood sugar. You may not know the answer to this, but I'm just thinking out loud. I'm really interested to see whether or not that increase in blood sugar and the influence on the adrenals is more pronounced in women than men. I bet you it is. I yeah, absolutely I absolutely bet you it is. I would mm-hmm. suspect it is too. And, and so many of these conversations that are happening related to intermittent fasting and then all the fancy coffees we can do that everyone is very vested in saying uh, will not influence your state of ketosis. Most of that research is done on men. Yeah. And again, I always say men, 10 times as much testosterone as women. That's why it's easier for them to do a keto and, you know, a keto dirty diet versus a keto clean diet, right? And that's what I realized too. Why do women, you know, have a harder time than men? It is that ten, you know, that difference in testosterone. I mean, men ten times as much testosterone, but also testosterone converts to estrogen. Why don't they have the brain fog we do when we're going in through hormone imbalance? And we talked about this in our podcast we did on keto green. We need estrogen in our brain to use glucose for fuel. We don't need it for ketones. And men have more circulating estrogen in their brain. Then women, because they're converting testosterone to estrogen, you would never know it, right? But testosterone is still 10 times higher, you know, in the postmenopausal compared to the postmenopausal woman. So it's really a pronounced different. And that's an anabolic steroid, right? If we're stressed, we're in a catabolic state, we're breaking down versus building up. It's so interesting. What do we need to pause to increase our libido? Mm, Yeah, definitely, you know, pausing sugar that does that does definitely interfere with us. Gosh, there, you know, the pauses, I will say it's in the pauses in our life where the magic happens. So it's pausing the to-do list <laughs> when we're getting intimate. It's also like the really understanding women, you know, what reinforces a healthy sexual appetite? What reinforces a healthy sexual appetite for us? And it's something I've I've learned in 
my working in sexual health for the last 20 years. And I created a program called Sexual CPR. And the first class is Hope Doctor. <laughs> I love it. I know, it's sexual also like CPR. So, just so true. Yeah. So true. Sex life needs reviving, right? And my patients would say, call 911. And the two like secrets that men need to know about women to get them to want more sex and also the secret that women need to know about men. And that number one secret to get them to have more sex is that he just needs to know that you're happy, that he's making you happy, that you're enjoying yourself. And when I, I talk to clients about when we're getting intimate, it's pausing the negative self-talk because there are those mirror neurons. And if we're like, oh, well, it, it, number one, if it hurts, if we're having vaginal dryness and menopause, it hurts. And you're like, oh, it's going to be uncomfortable. Let me just, you know, let me just power through this for the sake of our relationship. It doesn't work because those mirror neurons. So number one, we've got Jolva to help with that. And we're going to circle back to Jolva because I need everybody to know about this. But yes. So good. And so so that's one thing. And then the number one secret, and then that really I want to emphasize, the guys just want to know you're happy, you're enjoying yourself. And that goes in and outside the bedroom. So it's our responsibility to say, what makes us happy? Yes. You know, what am I? And, and start speaking it every like, oh, God, I'm so happy that this is clean. This is good. My daughter doesn't have chocolate handprints on this. Oh, well, there's one. Okay. But focus on the 90% of it that doesn't have chocolate handprints, right? So that's really important. And then and start expressing that. It makes me happy when you take out the trash. It makes me happy when you don't leave your underwear on the ground. <laughs> you picked it up. So like the things that make me happy. Okay. You know, if you take out the trash every day without me asking, I want to have more sex with you. That's a pretty good statement. That will work. I guarantee that will work. You know, all joking aside, the number one thing that I wanted men to know about women to get them to initiate sex is what I've learned in my study, my research on oxytocin. Oxytocin for women and men react differently. For men, it makes you want to roll over and go to sleep. For women, it makes you want to connect and feel intimate. And so I had this couple, this is the best way to explain it, I had this beautiful couple who came to my office and they were in their 30s. And they'd been married for a while and they came in for a sexual health cons consult. And he says, you know, Dr. Anna, I mean, we, we have sex and she has great orgasms, but she never initiates it. And I, and I said, well, number one, what do you do after you have sex? He's like, after? I'm like, yeah, what do you do after you have sex? And he said, oh, I roll over and go to sleep. That's the problem. So that's what oxytocin is making you do. What she needs is two minutes of intimacy. Like as long as it takes for you to brush your teeth, tie your shoes, you know, get dressed. I mean, just two minutes and that connection, reinforcing what you love, you know, what you're grateful for, what you're just having positive communication com connection. Just that time, it's so critical for a woman's physiology. And, you know, with rare exception, right? That's how we're designed. So they implemented that. They came back three months later and they're like, oh my gosh, she's been initiating sex half the time now. I mean, it's so true. It's so true. Now, if we have barriers to comfort during sex, like, for example, it hurts, or we have a discharge, or we have odor, or we get a bladder infection, those are things that, like, why would you want to have sex? I mean, that sounds terrible. That's a consequence of hormonal changes on the most important real estate of our body. A hundred percent. And I, I, speaking of the most important real estate on our bodies, and we, you alluded to this in passing, but I just want everyone to know, this is just a straight, I'm just going to call this a straight up plug of a product that Anna created called Jolva. And I knew about it, but hadn't experienced Jolva. And then we were at a, at a retreat in the last six months together. And she's like, here, try this out. And it's amazing. Can you please explain to everyone what Jolva is? Because I've got tubes and tubes of it now upstairs because it's, it's honestly just so incredible. Oh, yeah. And I, I do recommend one by the bedside, one by the bathroom or the toilet, you know, one at your cosmetic stand. I'm telling you, when I closed my practice, right, and, and had, you know, full disclosure, burnt out from my practice. PTSD trauma and my ex-husband's traumatic brain injury, and he was in a coma for months. So like all of that coming to culmination, right? And my patients were like, Dr. Anna, no one will give us your hormone creams. No one will write your prescriptions. They're not familiar, like compounding special topical creams, like for vaginal health and for, you know, increased pleasure during sex. And I said, okay, well, let me come up my challenge to myself because I didn't want to leave my patients hanging. I'm like, I serve them. I can't let them suffer, right? And so I said, I'm going to come up with something over the counter that you won't need a prescription for that's better than anything I could write on a prescription pad. And so that was my challenge. And so, you know, just for again, for me and my patients, 
So I combined um, DHEA, plant stem cells from the Alpine Rose, which is this beautiful flower that blossoms in the ice and snow and rocky terrain of the Swiss Alps. For me, that defines women post-menopause, right? Defines femininity. You can blossom in hardship. Plus, these plant stem cells are antiviral, improve collagen production, improve skin elasticity. So it's a perfect combination. And then adding in emollients, the, you know, shea butter, coconut oil to help with um, natural absorption and also no parabens, no sodium lauryl sulfate, which are many hormone creams. I mean, you just like none of those hormone disruptors that are affecting our most valuable real estate of our body. So really keeping that kind of very balanced approach to help your body restore. And so what we've seen Certainly using, and also the other piece to this, Megan, so because being a physician, we know this, but like I would say, if it, if it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't bring you pleasure, don't put it in your vagina. <laughs> you heard so, it here first, everyone. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, seriously. So using vaginal suppositories and things like that just weren't ideal. And where I practiced in Southeast Georgia, it's really hot. And so the suppositories would melt by the time you got home or you know, if you left them in the car, forget it. It's a mess. Okay, did all that. So I wanted something topical and that you can apply to the clitoris all the way to the anus because those tissues suffer too as we get older. That is regenerative, smells good, tastes good, is fine for the guy as well as it is for the girl. So you can definitely use it that way. You can use it on a vibrator. You can use it during sex and it helps to restore your body's own natural moisture. So I mean, that's the key. It helps to restore. And what we've seen is the natural rugation. I have a 65-year-old who uh, wrote me the other day and she said, you know, Dr. Anna, my gynecologist says I have the vagina of a 25-year-old. <laughs> I'm like, thank you. That's the kind of testimonial <laughs> you just want to stick on any website. <laughs> I know, right? I'm going to start like, hey, I'm 55 with the vagina of a 25-year-old. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> that's, that's the profile headline for Match.com, right? <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'll have to try that one. Dr. Anna, <laughs> what can people expect when they pick up an open menu pause next week? When you open it up, you're going to see beautiful recipes and color photography. You're going to see really like five amazing six day plans that make it easy. You'll be able to read through this in no time. It's just, it's designed to be used and a resource and enjoyed. You know, we have hundreds of pages of color photography. Our, our editor did a great job. Yeah, it's so beautiful. And the recipes in there are so beautiful. My Texas rodeo skillet, creating things that are healthy from some of our favorite things. My tabbouleh, instead of using bulgur wheat, I'm using broccoli sprouts. So it's even more hormone balancing and lower carb. And it's so such a medicinal food, partially in and of itself. So you'll find some amazing recipes, medicinal foods, and easy, fun book that you're just going to want to share and do the plants with. And I'm excited because I'm bringing it in community and doing them right alongside of you and some of my community groups. So I love that. Oh, it's so fantastic. And here's my plan. I'm, I'm going to sit down with my copy and I'm going to pour myself a glass of fermenting drinkable vinegars. And I, <laughs> I'm just going to have, I'm going to have some me time on my own version. It's going to be, it's going to be amazing. I love it. Here's what I want to do. I want to I want to transition. Uh, I want to transition the interview, and I want to ask you something about what I call our ingredients for impact. And I want to get perspective on a few different pieces. So I really believe that there are some fundamental ingredients that enable us to live as impactful women and and as impactful leaders generally. My first question for you, Anna, is what is your source of courage? Because you could not have gotten to where you are today without cultivating courage in your life? Where does that come from? You know, truthfully, it's from my faith. If I didn't have a strong faith, I wouldn't be sitting here in front of you today. I mean, I recognize this as truth. You know, it's a process. It's a process. It's it's a practice and a process, but faith has been really a big part for me. I am part of something bigger. I am part of something. I'm part of you. You are part of me. We're in this together, right? And so for the good of all, and that's been really powerful for those who have been given much, much is expected. What is a significant non-negotiable for you in your life? Let me put my mind back on, because I went right into sex. You know, I mean, it's like. (laughs) And that is okay. That's where it went. That's where it went. 
I think that's a really important, like to have a healthy relationship, a healthy sexual relationship with someone you love and care about for the rest of your life. I think that's, that's one thing. And, it, and I think the important thing is that we, we understand that the health that we do for ourselves, like taking care of ourselves, being healthy myself helps my kids be healthier, helps those around me who love me be healthier, sets a tone. But a non-negotiable, uh, healthy sexual relationship with someone, yeah, ideally getting married and having amazing 50-year anniversary at some point. I'll be very old, but I'll be very excited to do that. <laughs> well, you will have the vagina of a 25-year-old. So really, you've got all yeah. you've got all the tools. I got, I got it. <laughs> got all the tools that you need. What is the most important failure that you have moved through in your life? I was asked this in an interview with Forbes, Megan, and they said, well, you know, what have you learned from your failures? And I said, what failures? You know what I mean? Really, like, I don't look at it as failures. I look at it as opportunities. I could definitely, and I think that's part of retraining my brain from being in that PTSD state. I look at retraining my brain. And so I look at it as opportunities. So I would say the most significant opportunity I had was recognizing that there's many different ways I'm a good physician and doctor. I didn't have to have, I don't have to have that shingle on my door seeing, you know, 50 patients a day to impact the health of women around the world. Last question for you, Anna. As an entrepreneur, were you born with it or did you learn to become an entrepreneurial goddess? Oh my goodness. Yeah, no, it's definitely learning, right? It's learning, but from an early age, I started working when I was 13. So I think it was creating the opportunity. It was so funny because I was thinking about this today, Megan, and you cannot ask me any more hard questions. I'm done. But I'm done okay, with the hard good. ones. Okay, good. When I was like 15, 16, I was cleaning hotel rooms. So I'm first generation American. Dad was Navy, retired, when worked two jobs his whole life. We you know, raised a family of five. But uh, so I started working, I was cleaning hotel rooms and I, and on, I created these little cards and had a little swan on the front and inside it said, I hope you enjoyed everything. I, or something, I hope you enjoyed everything and that it was to your satisfaction. Tips are greatly appreciated. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, that was pretty entrepreneurial, right? And was also recognizing, um, yeah, just asking for what you want too. And so sometimes that was a, you know, motel, it was in a, and it wasn't a great hotel. But anyway, it definitely worked. It definitely worked. Well, I'm glad you got you got that seed planted early on, the work and influence that you have within your body of knowledge, but within your friendships and your communities is so profound. I'm so proud of your impact. And I am so honored to be a part of that a journey. Dr. Anna Kabeca, thank you for being here. Oh my gosh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thank you, my friend. I want everyone to know you can follow Anna along on her journey. You can gain access to her book. We're going to hook you up with how you can find uh, Jalva. Everything is in my show notes. You can find those at meganwalker.com forward slash podcast. Thank you again, my friend. Impact is what lives on when we leave the room, tuck them in or step off stage. It is less about what you do, more about how you make them feel and everything about how you choose to show up in the world. If you enjoyed this podcast, hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you are listening to this episode. I am your host, Megan Walker. Until next week, aim for impact. <laughs>